Kareem Herndon Brown, one of the co-authors of The Black Family's Guide to College Admissions, coming from to you live from the Dot Shop Bookstore in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I'm here with my co-author, Timothy Fields, and we're going to introduce you to our book, because we wrote this. We're celebrating its six-month anniversary uh, tomorrow, March 6th, came out September 6th, 2022, and uh, yeah, we're really proud of our, our work, and I'll let Tim introduce himself in a moment. Um, my name is Shereen Herndon Brown. Like I said, I run an educational consulting firm, Strategic Admissions Advice. I used to be a school counselor at several uh, New York City and Pennsylvania independent schools, or uh, one in each state. <laughs> um, and I also uh, used to work at Georgetown University in admissions. So I come to the process to writing this from 25 years of different college admissions counseling experiences to give information about the college process as in particular as it pertains to black families and what they should be thinking about. This is by no means a book of do this, do that, but more of a way to facilitate a conversation about black families and college admission. My co-author Tim, uh, Timothy Fields will introduce himself and his role in the book. So excited to be here. It's always good to be home. I'm originally from Arlington, Texas, but you know some of my earliest memories are from uh, this you know neighborhood in which I went to a school not too far from here um, in an elementary school. Uh, but Timothy Fields, I am Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Admission at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. I am fortunate enough to be co-author of this book. Um, over the past 25 years, I have worked in various areas of higher education, uh, worked with federal TRIO programs. I have read with several scholarship organizations, Jack King Cook, National Merit, Gates Millennial Scholars, and then obviously a lot of my work is centered around kind of access, diversity, and higher education. And I'm also a graduate of, of Morehouse College. So, you know, historically black college and universities is something that is very, very important to me. And so as we uh, went about writing this book, we wanted to come to it from very, uh, you know, various standpoints. And so, you know, I think I'll let Shereen tell the story of how it began. Uh, but one of the things that was critical uh, to us in writing this book is that, you know, we really, you know, help people understand that blacks aren't a monolith. The black people have different experiences, they have different backgrounds, they want different things out of their educational experience. And so we wanted to, you know, come from it from that lens. But, you know, it was Shereem's idea. Uh, I will always give him credit for that, and he'll let you know uh, how that idea came to be. So thank you, uh, Timothy. Uh, we started in summer 2020 during what we call now the racial reckoning of America. We were all home. Through the pandemic, we watched the horrific murder of George Floyd. We saw the incident park, um, in which you know a white woman blatantly was screaming, uh, "Crying wolf!" with a black man standing you know 20 feet away from her, which was horrific to see as well, all caught on video. And it was at this time that I became, as we all were, incensed about how race relations were going on in our, our country. But what was also happening was there was a uh, a movement going on online on Instagram called Black at IG. Black at IG, insert any private school that you want to, primarily. And where students were talking about using Instagram as a platform, the, the micro and macro aggressions against them, and I saw a common thread that so many of these students, students were talking about their college counseling process and how they felt that they may not have been fully served, how there were counselors who had suggested schools that they thought might have been beneath them, which is called undermatching. There was suggestions, you know, they, they made assertions that their counsel didn't know them at all and really didn't care too much about the process. So whether it was universal or not, these black at IG posts really resonated with me as a parent of independent school students, as a former independent school student, as a faculty member of independent school students. So in that, I wanted to share information, but I knew I couldn't and shouldn't do it alone because I'm just one person. So I thought about Tim, he and I have been friends for about 10 years previous, and he has a unique position of being the Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Admission at Emory University. That's one of the most selective schools in the country. Couple that position with his own personal college experience, and I've been going to uh, Morehouse College, and a historically black college university. So that dynamic that Tim has within himself, I saw could be very helpful to creating a book that would talk about applications and admission, and I thankfully, uh, when I called him, he picked up the phone, he said, yes, let's do it, and then we spent the next 18 months writing the book. And so one of the things as we're writing the book is that, 
you know, as Shereen alluded to, we're different. He went to the predominantly white institution, Wesleyan University in Connecticut. I went to Morehouse College, historically black college, historically black college university in Atlanta. He is a first generation college student. I'm a fourth generation college student. He went to independent schools. His children go to independent schools. Uh, so that is a viewpoint that he has. I went to public school all my life. My wife went to public school. We were very, our children go to public school. So we were very, you know, you know, you know, we're very like, we want our children to go to public school. So he uses a P Mac, I use a PC. Like, like there are all kinds of differences that we have. And we wanted to, you know, really kind of tell this story, you know, given that to the earlier point that blacks are the monolith. Also, you know, as soon as I uh, received the call from uh, Shereem, I hung up the phone. I looked at, uh, you know, I, I call, told my wife, I said, hey, Shereen wants, you know, help her write this book about black college admission, helping it out. And, you know, uh, you know, my wife just looked at me. She said, that's exciting. She says, but, you know, you and Shereen, what y'all aren't going to do is tell me about, as a black mother, about my black child that you don't know what's best for them. Yes, ma'am. We're not going to do that. And so then we wanted to expand the conversation to say we want to know about as many people as possible. So we interviewed over 200 uh, families from across the country. So, so, you know, California, New York, first generation, fifth generation, people who are just starting in second, third grade, you know, through the process, people who have already had fam children graduating uh, high school to reflect on different socioeconomic scales, predominantly white, you know, uh, institution graduates, APCU graduates. So we wanted to catch a full view of what are the different experiences that families were seeing as they were going about this process so that as we were telling this story, providing this resource, that we could provide as much information, but not from our limited perspective. We collectively have 50 years of experience between us, but you know, there's so much more to the college admissions and experience, the experiences people have that we wanted to share. And when Tim says it's very important that you remember that this is a resource. So yes, it says the Black Families Guide to College Admissions and we want to families to have it, black parents, black students, but it's also a resource for bookstores and for allies and other educators who want to help black students. So we're very, very confident, dare I say, that we've put together a good work, um, having surveyed so many parents and counselors, having our own personal experience with many of our friends having kids applying to college. I have a daughter who's 27 years old who went to Xavier in HBCU. I have a son who's a, who's a recruited athlete who's at the University of Memphis in uh, uh, PWI, predominantly white institution, for those of you who don't know. Um, so given all these lived plus personal experiences, we put together a resource that was really meant to serve. Um, Tim particularly, but I'll include myself a little bit, as a, as a heart of a, of a higher, you know, someone in higher education who wants to lift people up and bring them into an educational space for them to thrive. I respect that about him. I, too, want to help, but in a different way. I'm much more of a motivational and encouraging factor where Tim is very logistical and wants to kind of outline exactly the steps that kids need to um, take in order to get into school. So our energies, our partnership is to put together this resource that we hope will serve people, particularly on chapters like um, uh, the resurgence of HBCUs. Where we talk about many historically black colleges that may not get the same attention as Morehouse, Spelman, and Howard. As we talk about the uh, the recruitment process, like I said, I'm a parent of a Division One college athlete. That process, so many of us say, well, my kid will get an academic or excuse me, athletic scholarship. There are some hoops you got to jump through, and it's not easy. So we give you all that. Tim was great about talking about how um, black boys are reviewed in college admissions versus black girls, um, and we in a chapter called Gender Wars. So we put together what we believe is a great starting block for any college-going black family, but also for any educator who's in a space to help black families go get to the next level of higher education. And, and so just very logistically, the way the book is set up, uh, you know, Shereen uh, very eloquently outlined kind of there are three sections. There's the context. What is the place we are at as far as black people in this country? You know, you know what are the decisions that we have to make? You know, one of the things I think about my personal experience, you know, I have twins that are nine years old. They'll be 10 in, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, and as my wife and I thought about living in Atlanta, wanting them to go to public school, where do we want to go to public school? It was a six to nine month search. 
of a neighborhood, we wanted to put them in as far as, you know, what is the diversity of school? You know, what is the school's rating? You know, you know how was the proximity to our, our home? And what we ended up in is that we found out there were two to three neighborhoods in the Atlanta metro area that had everything we wanted. But when we moved to that neighborhood, we had to get a smaller house. We had to make some concessions. And this was as we were thinking about our children going to kindergarten. And these are concessions that black families have to make throughout this process as far as where are we going to educate our children? You know, what, what are the cultural trade-offs that we have to have? If we want to put them in a better school, more than likely that better school is a predominantly white institution. What does that look like for them? And so that's the first section of the book. And then obviously the second section is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, X, factors. X, X factors. Like what are the things that, you know, as you're going about this process matter? Gender matters. Listen, you know, I have a daughter. I believe in black girl magic. I have a sister. It's real. But there are so many more black girls that are going into the college, applying to college admission than black boys. I make the argument that the most valuable asset to higher education is the black male. We're in March. We're about to start March Madness. You know, there is a multi-billion dollar contract for people to watch Mark Madness because primarily they want to watch black boys play basketball. The same as the fall. You have all these primarily black boys who are playing football. And then the same is true if you get a, you know, a, a great, you know, academic black male who has the highest SAT score, GPA, all the Ivy Leagues want them. But then there are so many more African-American females that are applying to school and they're not looked at evenly in the process. And, you know, I say that FAIR is a place where they judge pigs, you eat cotton candy, you ride rides. FAIR is not real. And so we wanted to have this conversation for families, particularly who have, you know, young, you know, African-American black young ladies, that in this process, your daughter is going to have to do a little bit more. How is she going to have to stand out, particularly if she wants to apply to some of these selected schools? And then the last se section is the process. The process is the process. You need to complete essays. You may or may want to, uh, you know, take testing. You have to meet deadlines. You know, how are you going to apply? That's going to be the same no matter if you're black, green, yellow, whatever. And so we wanted, uh, you know, a mother who was interviewing us, you know, she told us, she said, I don't want to read a whole book. I'm not going to read a book from cover to cover. What do I need to do? My son is a junior. Okay, you go to section three, you look at that, and then you decide determine what you want to do. But there are other people who want to say, you know, tell me about historical black colleges. Why is all of a sudden this is resurgence of historical black colleges? You know, we talk to a lot of college counselors in this process, and they know about Morehouse. They know about Spelman. They know about Howard. They maybe know about Dillard. But there are 100 HBCUs throughout this country. You know, you know, there's Prairie View. There's Rust. There's, you know, Tuskegee. There's Jackson. There's, you know, Bethune-Cookman. You know, there's Philander Smith. You know, there are all, all these schools and there are opportunities for students at those places. And so we wanted to make sure that that information was highlighted as well. So, again, the, the, the process that Tim just spoke of, I really took the lead on um, because that's what I do for a living. Right? I help them to, nav to navigate college admissions process and give them exactly what to do and when. So, again, you can see we even have a podcast about admission and application, which represents our duality professionally and how we really believe that we can help people. Tim feels like bringing them up in an admissions way, I feel like helping them to get there. So we create, you know, almost a, a handoff from a, from a baton. Um, I think we're most proud of this book as we're learning, again, it's only been out for six months, is that the book has now entered what we call the black, not the black, the college admissions camp. And what that means is there's a lot of books written about college admission. A lot of them are good books written about college admission. They're not all good books, but some of them are. Our book is very intentionally specific to black students because we're fathers, because we're professionals, because we're black men. We want to make sure that our book is now in that college admissions canon, which it is, because of our intentions towards black families and black students. So we're proud of, of what we produced. Um, I think what's really cool about our book also is that we have this section where we highlight historically, excuse me, current famous black people who graduated from college. Um, if we play a quick game, if I was to ask you, how many black, famous black people can you name who went to college and where they went? What would you say? Anybody. Anybody. Famous black person who went to college and where they oh, went. Oh, famous black person yeah. went to college? Yeah. Um, 
Felicia Rashad. Felicia Rashad. Went to Howard. Went to Howard. Mm-hmm. Where did this famous, another famous black person, where did they go to college? Oh, Oprah. Oprah went to what school? Tennessee State. Tennessee State. Anyone else have a, a famous? Yeah. Howard, Howard. Yes. Taraji. Oh, yeah. Taraji yeah. P. Her, she went to Howard, Anthony. And do you know anyone Anderson. else? Evan Anderson. Anderson. Uh, he went to Howard. He finished off with yep. He went yep. to Howard. He and his son walked together just mm-hmm. last spring. So, Chadwick. Chadwick Boseman, oh, Howard. That person. Name the uh, oh. oh, she was a coach at Jackson State. Yeah, uh, Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders. But he didn't go to HBCU. Mm-hmm. He did, he did. He, he, he grabbed Ta- him. Talladega. Talladega. He grabbed, he grabbed yeah, Talladega. you're right, you're right. So, again, I'm, watch this. If I, a famous black person who went to college, if I go, body yadi 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 who's that? Yeah. Oh, Megan Thee Stallion. Thee. So Megan Thee Stallion, right? So what we did was we have 80 famous black Americans now where they went to college. President Barack Obama went to Occidental first, then Columbia. But his wife, Michelle, went to Princeton first and then Harvard Law School. We talk about people like Samuel Jackson have been going to Morehouse. We talk about uh, Will Packer, a you know, nice. huge movie producer. Spike Lee. Spike Lee, Morehouse also. But Princeton's not. Nice. Say it again. You said Princeton, then Harvard, but Princeton's not... Uh, HBCU. No, 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 we know it's not HBCU. Oh, okay. No, it's just where they went to college. Oh, you're talking about in general now. In general. Oh, okay, my and bad, that's the my point bad. Of what we did is that we showed that success doesn't equal HBCUs, and sex, success doesn't equal PWIs. Okay, right. We wanted to highlight famous black Americans and where they went to college so that families, students, educators could see there's not one way for success. It's right. not a recipe that's rooted in HBCUs and not a recipe rooted in PWIs. There are great schools across this country who have graduated, that's the key word, graduated great black Americans who are doing amazing things that we wanted to make sure people didn't just say Spike Lee, Martin Luther King Jr., Samuel L. Jackson, Morehouse, Taraj B. Henson, Kamala Harris, Howard, Chadwick Boseman, Felicia Rashad, Howard. Guess what? There are other schools that people have come from. HBCUs and not, and we wanted to highlight that. And, 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 you know, obviously we, you know, wanted to redefine success is what the term we have, you know, used. We want to say that if we want to applaud President Barack Obama, the first black president of the United States, and his wife going to Ivy League, you know, institutions, there's only one federal holiday named after a black, black person. That's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he went to Morehouse College. So, so, you know, there's only one black vice president of the United States. And woman. And woman. She went to Howard University. So you, you can't say that, oh, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, these schools is going to be more successful. As we were interviewing families, there were three general buckets of families. Families that the parents, black families, went to predominantly white institutions. Think I think a predominantly white institution is a better reflection of the world. I think it's more diverse. I think it has more resources. I think it's going to set my you know, child up for success. Then there was, you know, parents who said, I went to, you know, an HBCU. My child's going to HBCU. My money's going to HBCU. Point blank, end of story. You know, I have a son. You know, I went to Morehouse. My wife would say that Alexander Fields has a choice in where he's going to school. That man ain't got no choice. All right? Maybe, maybe, maybe he does. But all that to say is... He's going to Michigan, right? <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. And then... <laughs> then there's a third, the third group is which you're going to look at both historical black college universities, predominantly white institutions. But the first two are the loudest. And they, they, they're, the most, they're the ones that really say, this is where I want my child to go. And what we want to say in this book is success has its both places. We're not going to say one is better than the other. You know, what we, we say is if you say that my child only wants to consider predominantly white institutions, why is that? If you say my, you know, uh, you know, child only needs to consider historical black college universities, why is that? Because depending upon the needs of that student, what they're looking for, there might be something else that they need, and we want families to keep an open mind throughout this process. So, in conclusion, I'll say that this book was written for y'all, meaning black parents, meaning black students, black grandparents, uh, white teachers and educators, white people in higher education. We want to make sure that this book is accessible to any college-going human being, whether they be a first generation like me, or a first generation like Tim. Fourth, fourth, excuse me, fourth. first, fourth. Um, Tim's mother, also being very, very humble, who's in the crowd today, was the first African-American dean of admission at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. 
That's a big deal because Tim is now following in his mama's footsteps, being an influential person in higher education, um, and that, and again, that matters. So that's totally generational legacy, a little bit of nepotism. But the bottom line is um, we're very, very proud of what we've produced. We think it speaks to people in, in different fields, uh, excuse me, di different scenarios. We've had a lot of people email us or, or you know, can contact us through social media and say that certain parts resonated with them more than the other. But ultimately, we wanted to spark the conversation. We've given you some facts, timeline for success, but we want the conversation within black families um, and educators to be one of how to go to college, what you need to do, why you need to do it, but understand what you're looking at, whether it be a PWI or an HBCU. And then finally, just from a very practical standpoint, you know, if you flip through the book, uh, we've highlighted a lot of colleges and universities. We even have a, you know, you know, schools that we think are blessed for black students. It's an anecdotal list. It's not driven by data. It's driven by college admission professionals, college counselors, parents, who they say, my child got the most out of this place. The, the list will continue to grow, um, but we really wanted to provide a resource. And so if you are interested, you know, in, you know, like you come across, you know, University of Michigan, it's going to say how many people went to University of Michigan, where University of Michigan is set, uh, you know, whether or not they have undergraduate, graduate. So you have a quick glimpse of, you know, what that school is like. Because what we found is that a lot of people, they know the names, but they don't know where the school is at. They don't know, you know what the school looks like. And so we wanted to provide uh, that information. We also have a listing of all of the historical black college and universities. Because you know, we wrote a chapter called The Black Ivies where we highlight Morehouse, Spelman, and Howard. But we really did that to really you know, poke the bear a little bit that they're over 100. That like we, you know, we were interviewing families and counselors. They only knew about Morehouse, Howard, you know, Spelman. Maybe they mentioned Hampton. Maybe they mentioned Florida A and M, North Carolina A and T. But then after like six or seven names, they didn't know. And so we wanted to make sure they had that information. So as people who may not know about historical black college universities, they have a resource to say, oh, this is where it's at. This is the setting. Uh, this is what it can provide. And so we can, you know, utilize that as a resource. So we hope that you'll get the book. Whether you're watching online, please go to our website, understandingthechoices.com. Again, as the title suggests, we want, we're giving families choices, trying to talk through a variety of colleges, a variety of things to consider to have a conversation. You can find us also on social media at Understanding the Choices. Listen to our podcast, Application to Admission, and please um, buy the book for yourself or for someone that you know, because we, we really believe that's a valuable resource that we want to affect people's lives. And it's available at Doc's Bookshop. So please. Come <laughs> yeah, Doc's Bookshop. Absolutely. 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 Thank you so much for having us. Wonderful. QA? I have a question. All right. Well, actually, I just, yeah, I have a request. Can you, one of you, can you just kind of, you, you mentioned a table of contents. Can you kind of read off some of the, the, um, Chapters? Chapters. Sure. Mm -hmm. I actually think that's a very good question. First chapter, black parents. The choices we make now matter later. What is that about? Where you choose to live in terms of where the, the proximity to a public school. Um, are you exposing your, your child to college by taking them to homecomings or football games? Anything that's going to get them excited. So the choices we make now affect how our kids think about college later. A shift in power, which was an excellent chapter, arguably my favorite, written by Tim. The resurgence of HBCU culture. Understanding how popular media is now um, you know, giving F uh, uh, HBCUs more, I guess, light and shine. Whether that's Michael Strahan being on Good Morning America or, or uh, Reed Hastings of, of um, Netflix donating all these money to HBCU causes. The ex-wife of Jeff Bezos, Mackenzie uh, Scott, giving all this money to HBCUs. All of a sudden, everybody has a lot of attention towards HBCUs, which is great. So we want to kind of, you know, kind of ride that wave of popularity and um, about HBCU culture. Um, I wrote a chapter about called Liberal Arts Education and Is It Worth It? Which really sparks the conversation of should our kids be going to schools primarily to have a skill in which they can translate to a career post-college or is it okay for them to take, you know, humanities courses, sociology and uh, philosophy that are more critical thinking but what does that help them to do professionally afterwards? It's a conversation. I feel a lot of different ways about it. Um, 
What questions should your family be asking? What questions should you be asking your family is also to kind of uh, spread some conversation. And I think that's, we talk about sports and special talents. Show me the money. We talk about financial aid, um, which is very, very important because we believe that the four key pillars of searching for college should be rooted in cost, location, possible major and possible career. So with that, we want to make sure that you are thinking and discussing in your family how money affects the college process, not just getting in, but staying there. In a perfect world, we do not take too many loans. We understand that loans are important, college is expensive, but maybe that's you that adjust your college list because you don't want it to be something where parents have to take parent plus loans, which have high interest rates and can take them well past their, you know, their retiring age. So we, have, we feel like we really touched on a lot of things, but we're also aware of things that we missed or at the time we're not as relevant. We're in the works of uh, negotiating a second edition for, our, for the book um, and a specific timeline. But we know that right now this is a great book, a great resource, and we encourage you to get it. And, 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 and talk about In Our Opinion. So we also have a chapter called In Our Opinion, which I took the lead on and said, the first line of my part is, I'm not sure college is for everyone. And I say that wholeheartedly. I don't believe that. I think that we're past the time in American history where, you know, you must go to college in order to be successful in, in life. Let's to redefine success. And because college is so expensive, because there are a lot of people who went to college who are unhappy, we want to make sure that we are not suggesting that you don't go to college, but we're trying to make people think that there isn't just one way. College is a way, not the way. And I do think that if you're going to not go to college, then just have a plan uh, in your family what is the plan from 18 to 22 to 35 how are you going to use the same way you would ask them to major in something and what you hope this degree will lead to what are you going to do during this critical age of 18 to 22 that will set you up for the rest of your life ideally and in, in, in college is beyond just a four-year traditional college oh, right. that, that, that could be a trade school that could be a community college that can be any number of things but you know we strongly feel that you know, in order to narrow the wealth gap in this country for black people, college is going to be at the foundation of that. You know, obviously there's the Kobe Bryant's, the LeBron James, the you know, Jay Z's, Beyonce, people who were highly successful who didn't go to college, but that's the exception, that's not the rule. The majority of people, black, white, anybody who's successful in this country went to college and we want to make sure to provide a resource so that if that is what you want to do, uh, it's a conversation that you can have, but particularly we wanted to you know, have that conversation because we are our parents, we are black, because we understand the experience and the decisions that we make daily for our children, and we're going through this as well. So this isn't just us on, you know, talking about, oh, this is what you should do. You know, every day I have to think about you know, the, 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 the experiences my children have. You know, what classes are they going to take? You know, what does that look like for them? And this is going to happen for the next 10 years up until they apply to college, or there might be another path. Shereen's son was a recruited baseball player. He had the opportunity to, to go to Major League Baseball directly from high school. But that was a conversation that they had to have amongst themselves. And so we are in this process with you all. So it's just not us saying we know everything because we don't know much. Uh, but we wanted to begin the conversation. I want to say they're humble. <laughs> but all the admission books that are in your students' houses or the counselor's office were written by white authors. This is the first time African Americans have written an admission book. And for that, it should be publicized because we need to know the information that they're giving us in this book. And so, so we're, we're not the first. There, 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 there are other admission books that were written by black people. We want to be clear on that. However, you know, by a major university press that is as much publicized and marketed in the way that ours is, yes, it, it is the first. But, you know, there are colleagues that we have uh, throughout the country that we work with very closely that have had this conversation uh, but, you know, ours is the first that has been marketed at this level. Um, I want to say how much of the book talk is because trade shoes and trade shoes have been so popular now. Like, a lot of them are opt-in. I'm a traditional, so I went the traditional uh, educational route. 
only are opting to go to the junior college or the college, and so you're not even, how does that four year thing look down the road? And I, I, just, I just think the traditional approach has went to wayside. I don't like it, but hey. And, and, and all things change. And again, I think that we're, we're in this, this, this time in, in, our, in our country and in our history where people have, we have information at our fingertips. We have information in our pocket, right? So anything you can learn in a college classroom, academically, you have on your phone. Anything academically you can learn. You, say, YouTube is probably the best university in the world. Correct. <laughs> but again, Ooh, don't say that. But if, <laughs> but there are there's information out there. My it's nephew already thinks that. Some of it's good, some of it's not good, but there's some good college classes and some bad, not great college classes. The, the thing that's missing is the, the gathering of people, right, on a college campus during those critical years. And we all been, many of us been through them, 18 and 22. You think you know yourself, but you don't. But now you go to college campus, you get to around all, all, the whole bunch of other people who think they know themselves, but they don't. <laughs> and you all get to mess up together and succeed together, and then you have those relationships possibly for life. You know what not to do because you saw somebody else mess up in college. You're able to kind of change that dynamic. So I think tradition is good, but I'm not trying to say it's the only way. I do think vocational schools, we always going to need, I need a plumber. I'm not going to fix my toilet. So I need somebody else to know how to do it. And that's okay. Um, so again, I, I think we're offering an alternative or we're making a contribution. And parents who do want to go the college route, go in their eyes wide open. Understand how much this is going to cost you. I'm saying if you, if you send your kid to certain kinds of school, does that cost them culturally? Um, so I, I hope that we can have the conversation about what's right and what's wrong for each individual family. And if they make a decision and they want to change it, thankfully we can pivot. And, and let, me, let me reframe your question because we've received a question like this several times within the past week. And, and at the core of it is how do we connect children going to college and the information they can receive so, so that they you know, go on and go through a traditional path in this current age where on the phone you see people getting rich off IG, you see influencers, you see people like, you know, you know, getting, you know, success immediately, but those are exceptions of the rules, so we had to provide data. So a data point, the college graduation rate is significantly higher if you go from 18, four years throughout. If you started at a junior college, you know, you can get off college for life. There's no community, as Shereen was talking about relationships. And so the probability of you going through that four years is not the same as if you don't start. You know, uh, you know, place like, you know, Emory, they require, you know, a residential campus. You have to stay on campus your first and second year. Why do you have to do that? Because the probability, if you stay on campus your first and second year, more than likely you're going to create community. Ultimately, you are going to graduate. You are going to finish. And so there's data that, that supports that. And so we have to provide data to students so they don't see the exception, they see the rule. So, you know, if we go about having this conversation uh, as we had, you know, why, why, why do we need to have names? You know, most of the names that immediately come to say famous black people are, edu are um, sports and entertainment. LeBron James didn't go to college. Jay-Z didn't go to college. Steph Curry had all the money in the world he went back and got his college degree. Megan Thee Stallion had all the money in the world. She went back and got her college degree. So we need to provide names. We need to provide narratives. We need to provide data. And that's what we try to do with this book. So it's not just having this conversation that, oh, you need to go to college so you can better yourself. You need, you need to say names that, you know, oh, I want to go in IT. Okay, you know who Morgan DeBron is? Morgan DeBron is one of the biggest IT people in Silicon Valley. She went to Wash U. You know, you know who uh, Tristan Walker is. Have you heard of Bevel, the the men's you know hair care hair care products, the blades and stuff like that? Nas talks about Bevel in his rhymes. He sold that to Procter and Gamble. He's a millionaire. He went to a SUNY school in New York. You have to provide names and information so students say, okay, I want to do this. Yes, there's only one Kobe Bryant. There's only one of a lot of these people, but there are a lot of people who are highly successful who went to college. And then the final thing I'll say is, uh, you know, I'm gonna have the numbers off. The lifetime earnings of somebody who graduated 
which is a high school degree, is probably $1.3 million. The lifetime earning of somebody with a college degree is over $3 million. So you're going to make significantly more money on the, in general if you go to college than if you don't. And if we don't provide these data points, students can't see it. And if you think that you've never made $1.3 million in your life, in lifetime, you out of every job you've ever had, and how much tax they take out, you, you get there. Okay, I, I, I got homework because I got all these issues in there. <laughs> you think every, along the way that a college, a university, will tie themselves? I mean, ever since COVID, and now everybody doing this, you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID, you know, and you made an excellent point that like, they lost a lot of that camaraderie, that relationship on campus, so. Mm -hmm. Just like my son in his situation, you know, he just 2020 March they had to leave campus. After that, it was very hard to get them back on the college campus. That was extremely hard. But so, do you think while there's such a shift that maybe the university can somehow link to trade programs and see how important trade programs, the kind of the Booker T. Washington approach, you know? How can we inject that into the HBCUs? Because I think this can lead a way for, you know, getting back to trade, which is where my son is at. Say, he didn't get a comparative college person. Even when I go to college, because I want to be an electrician, I had to go to get this, you know, I had to be an apprentice. So I would have spent four years here, but then I still had to come out and do four more years as an electrician. So. How do we kind of marry those concepts together? I think that's a new, that being my big. Man, and, 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 and it's, a, it's a great question, and, and it's an ideal. But colleges want to make money. So the, you know, why would they want to split money with a community college? You know, it, what's the win-win for them? Again, I'm not, we're not anti-vocational schools, trade schools, but we're not encouraging them either. It's got to be an individual process. That your kid really works towards their interests and or their strengths to do something that's important to them. I'm under the belief, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that between the ages of 18 and 22, there's only four things you can do. You can go to college, and that's why we wrote the book, and that's what we did, so we think that's a path. You can go to the military, and if you do that, I salute you, I appreciate you. My father's a Vietnam vet, I appreciate you, thank you. You can get a job at 18, you can get a job. You can go work somewhere and make an hourly wage that, that can help support you, or make a contribution to your current household, um, whatever it means. But right, so college, military, or a job, an hourly job. I think it's probably going to be salary, probably going to be an hourly job. Or you can go to jail. Sure. The only four things that you can do for black people. I don't know anything else. Right? right? People say, well, I, he can be an entrepreneur. He can create a business. Eighteen-year-olds don't quite have that yet. And as an adult, who's the eighteen's going to year eighteen years going to need some startup money. I'm not even giving them my $25,000 to start no business at 18. So I want them to get some training, some life experience, learn out who they are, what they want to do, what they're good at. So we think college is the best option. Military, nothing wrong with that. I don't want my son working at Starbucks right now and still live with me thinking that he's grown, but he got an hourly wage. And I don't want my kid going to jail. So I'll put him in college. And, and, and just, you know, for some data points, 4,000 college universities in the country. 2,000 offer bachelor's degrees, which means 2,000 offer trade schools, community college, things of that nature. There are a lot of relationships between schools, HBCUs, predominantly white institutions, that students can have you know, direct access. So there are programs, but this is why we want there to be a larger conversation about what is the resources available in my family, what are the you know skill sets of my child? What are their strengths? And have that conversation and do the research because I guarantee you there are programs that will say, okay, you take a trade, you know, you do well, you can automatically go on to this four-year program if that's what you want to do, or we will set you up so that you can be successful in this trade or this area. And so there are programs, but too often, you know, they, people only think about you know, oh, they're only. 25 college universities are the most popular. Oh, they're only, like they put these in the buckets and they don't realize that there are a lot of, you know, relationships, internships, opportunities uh, that, you know, students can have. It's just about doing the research and finding a program. Like, we can't emphasize enough. This is the individual process.
that as we've gone all throughout this country, you know, you know, there are very clear, it's very clear that people have different paths. And that's why Shereen wrote, college may not be for everybody. There are people who are very successful who did not go to college. But, you know, for those who do want to go to college, we want to say these are some things that you should think about. These are some resources that are available to you. These are some questions you should ask. And these are some things that should be forefront as you begin this process. I have a question. Okay, so with the application process, what makes an application stand out, like, different year from, like, okay, she was very active in school, but her scores aren't the best, but, like, she has a high 3.5 or GPA or whatever, or, like, another student where their scores are the best, but they're not very active in school, but they're dedicated to their education, or, like, a kid with a 2.5 who's act active in school, but maybe not, or didn't score at all, like, he didn't test at all. So, like, what out of those, because I've seen it in y'all's case study chapter, what out of those makes one to college? Which one? Right, basically? depends on what college you're talking about, right? So every college. We, we have so we have somebody who's in the audience who went to the college, <laughs> and, 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 and I promise, his response in spending multiple years in college is going to be different than mine because it depends upon what the college is looking for. But at the core of it, and you you can chime in, please, sir, if you want, as a mission professional, it's you saying who you are. All right. It's important because the colleges want you to say, I want you to have somebody that's going to have a unique voice, is going to add something to our community, is going to, you know, differentiate yourself from other people. I use an example. I ran uh, track and cross country in high school. I then went on college to do that. On my college application, on my activity that said I ran track and cross country, my counselor probably said I ran track and cross country track cross country, my teacher probably said I had ran track cross country. So there's no need for me to write about what? That I ran track and cross country, all right? That's already established. You don't want to put yourself in a box because what they're looking for is I want to know all of this person could offer. But 2,000 college universities that offer bachelor's degrees, half of those have admit rates over 50%. They're going to admit the majority of the people who go to that school. Who apply. Who, who, who apply. But a lot of the times, the emphasis is on these, you know, top ones who have these low admit rates. And so you're just really thinking about, you know, where do I want to apply? What do I want to do? So the, 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 that's a long answer to your question is, obviously, your academic preparation is most important. All right? Let me be clear. This is an admission, you know, decision based upon how, you know, have you done in high school? Are you prepared to come to this college and be successful? All right, that's the first bar. Once you cross that bar, then it becomes who you are. So oftentimes students will say, hey, you know, I got a 1.5 GPA, but I got the cure for cancer, AIDS, COVID. I'm president of all these organizations. Should That's great, but you did not prepare yourself in the classroom. So the classroom is always going to be the first part. Then it's, you know, who you are. I would love for you to add something. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to make sure that you're in the right courses. Um, there are you know, gatekeeping courses that stop students from going to school because they don't have the opportunity to complete those in high school, especially math. Uh, math courses are really critical for, for many institutions and making sure you're on the right track, taking the right courses, getting good grades in those courses. So you really have to start early at middle school, uh, making sure that you're prepared for high school to be in the right track uh, so that when you complete your high school requirements that you have the right courses. Because that'll start right away. If you don't have the right courses, um, you're not even going to have a shot. Um, and then the grades you're getting in those courses are critical. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So my question is three. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's going to college and they're not sure to try to get around it because I have so much anxiety about doing it because I feel like if I take it and I don't pass, it's going to demotivate me. That's one part. One issue that I'm, uh, I'm dealing with. Another thing is, um, I'm a late bloomer. I live my life, my 20s are on me nothing, and I went back, in, went back to school when I started to get it right and get my head on straight, and I'm a mother of seven, and so I went back and did everything I wanted to do. And one thing I didn't do was go to an HBCU. And the last thing that I had left was my passport. And 
I really want to go and I want to do that experience, but is it worth it? That was my question. Because for the experience, I think it would be worth it, and I've always wanted to do it, but at the same time, financially, I have to be more responsible, and some businesses got to take that out. The next, the last question I have to is, with me and my children, all my children, I have five children that have graduated already from high school. One has graduated from college, one is entering college this year, another one is kind of like me with teeter tottering, and two that are already in the workforce with good jobs, but they're not really thinking about it right now. And I want to be a, a stronger influence to the other ones. Academically, I am. The fact that I went and done it, went back and did it, I am. And the way I live my life is also. But when you're looking at the world and the challenges that they're facing and paying bills and struggle, I'm having a problem with that type of influence to make it, to establish the benefit. Understood. So many layers to your question. Again, congratulations for, you know, recommitting yourself to education and having success. I'll start with number two, then I'll go to number three, and I'll let him answer number one. Um, number two is, should you go back and finish your doctorate? And I think that depends on what your motivation is. I don't encourage you to go back into more debt unless you see your doctorate giving you a significant pay increase, possibly. You know, if it's for the love of learning, Godspeed. If it's for, I think, you know, my, my, my doctor is going to help me, you know, earn you know, $350,000 a year, um, sure. But I don't think, I think the academic world is changing. I mean, Google and somebody, Apple, Apple, Apple said they don't even require uh, college degrees anymore. Right, right, they, they, right, they, don't, they, don't college, they don't require college degrees for their employees. So I think the more education we get has to be because that's who you are, what you want to do, not in pursuit of, you know, I, I'll, give, I'll make more money. Well, respectfully, I make more money than I would make with my master's. I'm an insurance adjuster, so I'm fine with financial. I think it is the love of learning because I never felt more fulfilled than when I went to school and mm -hmm. the challenges. And that's you. Now I'm at a place where I want to fix things. Like I see issues in education. I see issues in, within my community and with other women who were like I used to be. So that's kind of why. Because I don't feel like everybody has to have a college degree. I don't feel like that. I feel like people have their own ways that they can make it. But what I see an issue is some people don't see their way out of their environment. And I want to go back because somebody has to be the person who gets you through to those people. Okay. So yeah, so we would encourage you to continue to, you know, to live your life passionately in the way that you have. And if education is a part of helping you be that conduit to help others, then by all means. Um, I think the, 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 the third question that you're asking, again, a lot of this is personal for you in terms of how you're influencing your, your children. And, um, but from a college admission standpoint, since they know that you got in under different circumstances than them, I'm very positive you're leaving a very good influence on them because they know that education gives self-fulfillment and they can see that education you know, can elevate their, their financial life, that's important to them. So, I mean, you know, only thing I'll add is you add something about the HBCU experience. You know, in most instances, that's rooted in the undergraduate experience. Right. right. Eight, eight, 18 to 22. That, 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 that is 99% of the HBCU experience. So, so, so it's nothing that you can really go back and recapture because when I think about my HBCU experience, it was living in residential halls. It, 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 it was like, you know, the dining hall is closed at six, what are we gonna do? Let's put this five dollars together, get some ramen noodles and, and you know, some some cherry cola, and let, 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 let's figure this out. But like, the relationships that were built during that time. So that's something that, unfortunately, it'd be hard to recapture. I, I, I would, I would, Can I add something? So you have some background? So I'm Native American and black, but I was raised on my Native side. Mm -hmm. For me, it would have been more so for the cultural experience because so, 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 for the influence. So that's what he's saying. I see my, my beautiful sister wants to chime in. Howard University graduate, Juliana, please. I was, I was like having gone to an HBCU undergraduate and graduate. If you are really seeking, because I'm going to a TWI for graduate school, and then have a graduate degree at Howard University. So for the HBCU on graduate level, they do give a lot more 
application and PWI has been a lot more research. But if you're really looking for that HBCU experience, then they really teach the history, the cultivation. Tim is absolutely right. It's in the undergraduate that they really do that. Um, graduate programs across the board. Once you're in a graduate program, PWI or HBCU, you're in it together. You're trying to get through it together. So that experience is gonna be the same on graduate level. All professors are invested in you getting through that graduate degree. They all are invested in you getting that experience to get out in the world. So on the graduate level, and you've already gotten, you're already at your master's. Yeah, I have my master's. So on the graduate level, you're really not gonna have the experience of HBCU just because of what graduate level work is about. And, and, and so let, 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 me, let me just, you know, add this. Um, you know, the, if, if it's a cultural piece, I invite you, October 28th, Morehouse, Selby <laughs> Homecoming, best homecoming in the world. You can indoctrinate yourself and you can, you can live it. But also, you know, Shereen, I, you know, I would ask you because I don't have experience in this. You know, there are a lot of people who later on in life want that. They, can, they you know, go through uh, graduate chapters of the Divine Nine and be part of a sorority or fraternity. And that is something that allows to have that experience, but not at the same level as undergrad, but that is an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I play as undergrad, so I have met many graduates, um, old people who came into the frat or into sorority later in life because they feel like they missed something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not uncommon, and I definitely encourage you to, to you know, make sure you have no regrets in life. Um, but, but I do think that you've already done so much that I don't want you looking back where like you missed something versus you gotta go forward because you got much more to do. And, and, and also making an impact. We wrote, we wrote a book. We wrote a book. Like, 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 you know, like we, as 2020, and we saw what was going on in the world and, and our Black Lives Matters and all that, and you know, say, what, what could we do? And because we were educated, we said we want to write a book specifically for black people. And, you know, writing a book is not easy. We had to hold ourselves accountable throughout this process. Uh, we, you know, had a lot of, you know, challenges. We see the world differently to, you know, come together and say, you know, this is what we want to put out in the world. Uh, but, you know, people respond, you know, to, you know, if you want to make an impact. So there, there's another opportunity. So, yes, education is a great pathway you know, when I think about my graduate school education, I enjoy the conversation, the classroom, hearing multiple right. perspectives. But, you know, one of the things that we've been very excited about is what too often happens in education. You talk in a, you talk in a vacuum. You, 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 you essentially turn around and talk to the choir and say, hey, we need to sing. Oh, yeah, what do you want to sing? And, and, and then at no point in time do you project it out in the world. And yesterday we were in Little Rock. We were at a church talking with families who just said, you know, I want to know how this process begins. The day before we were in New York, talking with parents saying, you know, my children have been in predominantly white environments all their life. What would the HBCU experience be? And so talking directly to people and making that impact. And so this is our platform that we're using, but I would say find that platform. And, you know, it obviously can happen through education, but the, you know, in the world of social media, in the world of you know, this digital age, there's so many other ways you can make an impact as well. And I just say, you know, keep an open mind to that. This, this book is, you know, I mean, going through, it is actually very powerful for today. You know, I think we had the conversation that, you know, it was the first of its kind. I say in terms of incorporating the conversation, you know, of education, parenting, and race, because just in this room, you got parenting, education, and race. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I say it's, it is powerful. And, I'm, and I can be brought into the conversation because, you know, when you have these generations, and I'm looking at, okay, it's this big HBCU initiative, which I think is beautiful. And I send my son to an HBCU, but I come out of a uh, PWI. And so you make it where, you know, I think you said, hey, where are we as a family? This book navigates. 
get to see them and say, hey, what's the best for you? And being at Iowa, I was at Iowa State, so you know, it was, it is what it is. But they figured out the strategy is for you to visit other campuses. So we were always paid to go to like Clark and check it out. But we were actually Iowa State students, but they wanted us to graduate from that university. But they said, in order for us to graduate, we need to make sure you have these experiences or you're just gonna leave and not graduate. So I, I think that was crazy, but now it makes sense because I had the HBCU experience just going to the different workshops. And then a person in common to me, you guys never went to, you know, a, a actual HBCU, but you the one to open up a black bookstore. So it's, it, like you said, it's across the board. But I just think it was important to have that 18 to 22 experience that cultural environment and have us go down to Clark and Larry Spelman and all the different things. And Donna will probably tell you all the places that we, that they sent us to to make sure we graduate from Iowa. So, so I'm glad you said that. So it's a funny story. 2020, we begin writing this book. For, for, for 18 months, we, we go back and forth, the ideas, we you know read each chapter out loud, edit it. When we turned it in to the publisher, he said, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna look at the book anymore. Get the, get the proof back, said look at it, he's like, no, I'm done. I don't think he's looked at this book since May of last year, you know, like when you say what chapters, he had to open it up. He had to look because 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 you know I I would tell myself it's a really good book. Okay, I believe you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's it's just really to your point. Different people are coming through this process in different places. They want different things. You know, there are families that obviously want to you know, pursue predominantly white institutions, but the majority of colleges and universities in this country. There are only 100 HBCUs out of 4,000, so not everybody can go there. And so, yes, we wanted to have the conversation, and it's only the beginning. Like there, there are no real answers in here, because the answers happen within your home. All right, the answers are going to happen within what are the needs of your student? What is your bank? What does your bank account look like? Like, what is your situation? Where are you coming from? Those, those are going to provide the answers. But what we want to provide is what are the questions that you need to ask, what are the things you need to consider, and what are the factors that we want to make sure to put up uh, in the forefront as you're going through this process and you decide this process is what's best for your family. Okay, um, so, like, I'm homeschooled, so um, I've been hearing a lot of different advice about college because, like, I'm about to get drunk. So people were saying, like, I should start a community college first because it's a smarter route and it's um, easier route financially. But I want to go to PD because I'm a major in nursing and I heard that they have one of the top like nursing programs in the nation. So like, what advice would you like give me to like start? So, so let, let, let me start. First advice is when I hear pe people tell me, I want to know who those people are. Are those people in higher education? Are those people in admissions? Who are these people? Because a lot of times, like one of my, like we went through tangents, and one of my tangents is, you know, the, what I call the wine and cheese circuit. People like, oh, I heard this. Oh, somebody told me this. Well, who is that person? What is their knowledge base? Like, how much do they know about the process? So, you know, that's that's the beginning. Is like always be leery of where you are getting information from and how attached are they to the process as far as college admission and are they in a place to be giving you college admission advice like if they went to school 25 years ago there's so much that's changed about college admission in the past 20 years there's so much that's changed in the last three years and so you always you want to be clear of like you know when you're listening to people the advice you want to say you know i will call pv i will call a college admission office get some information from somebody directly who can give you the answers that you need and not just kind of the secondhand information. I'll go a little step further. I really think that, you know, between your two options, I don't think that you really have a bad route to go, right? It's really a personal thing. Do you want to go to community college? Do you want to go straight to PV? What will give you, get you what you want the quickest in the most efficient way? I do think cost matters a lot. But it's a personal decision. And again, so we're not trying to, the advice that we have is to get the information and then make a personal decision. 
Um, I will also say that I'm big, I'm so proud of you for having the intention of doing nursing, which will be a career that will never end. So you having that direction right now will help you out later. So in short, make a decision what you think is best for you. Don't worry about the homeschool thing. We've all been homeschooled for the past several years because of COVID, but I too used to homeschool my son and you are now unique in the application process, so it should work in your favor. Any other questions? I'm sorry. I, I, we want to sign again, books, go to lunch, and go to the airport. <laughs> I have a lot of nieces and nephews, like, right? This, this is the last one. Okay, this, okay, good. Um, there's oh. a, a couple of questions. Oh, Keeper got the last question. Okay, I'm sorry. Keeper, thank you. They're making money. I have a young, a lot of y'all, and I know you heard it. I think you probably already even answered it. But they are making money, and they're saying, hey, I don't even go, I haven't even been to school, and I haven't been, even done this, and I haven't done that. But I'm making all this money, and I'm gonna, it's going to even grow by just me working. I, but I, I think they need to go to college and have that experience, and I just think this is just temporary. Eventually, people are going to go back and look at your college education. I think this is just a... I, just, I disagree. I disagree. Okay. I mean... Money moves mountains. And if these kids are making money right now at 18, 22 on Instagram, if you're social media, why would they ever go pay somebody to go sit in the classroom or, or, or stare at a computer screen to do what? How's that gonna change their life? So I'm not trying to say, I don't think it's gonna change. I don't think it's college is the right thing for everybody. But again, we live in America. America is, is a capitalist country. Making money is, not all that matters, but it matters a lot. <laughs> and it is not wise for somebody who, if they if they're, if they're going to make money on Instagram as an influencer in whatever capacity from 18 to 22, I would rather them think about, okay, now what do I need to do from 22 to 27? And then during those five years, what am I going to do from 27 to 45? Like, let's, 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 let's encourage them to keep leveling up, right? So it's not a fad, leveling up. But college isn't the answer for people who already feel like they don't need it. Don't go to college if you think if, if you don't want to be there. Because if you don't hunger, if you're not hungry, you ain't gonna eat. And if they don't want to be there, they feel like I should I should be here, they're gonna get bad grades, and then they wasted somebody's money. Their parents are taking out loans. And all only thing I'll add is, you know, what is money? Like like like, like you know, I think we need to provide perspective of, you know, if somebody says, Oh, I'm making a lot of money. Like, like what, what is what is a lot of money? And I think depending upon your situation, where you're coming from, I mean, put some perspective on that. So, you know, if they're making, you know, $100,000, $200,000 a year, doing that, yeah, do that. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead. That's more, more than the majority of people make in this country a year. But if, the, you know, they, you, they say, how much money did you make last year? They say, oh, I made, you know, $30,000 selling on eBay. Uh, that's poverty. You know what I'm saying? So I, I just think we need to provide some perspective. I think information is always important. And I think, you, you know, with, with people, particularly at this young age, you know, know is different with somebody who's lived a, a lot more perspective. And so I think providing perspective and placing some context is very critical as we're having these conversations. subs that come to my school and they're young and they're like still um in school and they go to philander and um one of them her name is Haley Larry she um is in law school and another one is Sean Gill he um he was telling me like um I should like come to philander and check it out because they have a course or a program that you can take where you can go after you get out of high school and they'll like um give you money uh, or support you some type of way financially if you take the class and take the course and decide to go to that school. And I was just like, I want to ask, like, is it good to like have options, like keep options open? Mm -hmm. um, like, even if you even if you know you have your mind like set on one college, like after high school, you you change, like you will evolve Absolutely. as a person. So, like, is it like good to just have your options open? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Straight up, yes. Options are good at all times. Because if something don't work, you got plan B through Z. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Oh. But, but, but I mean, at, 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 for college, you have to at some point make a decision where I want to be. Like, what is the situation that's going to set me up best for where what I want to do if college is a path that I'm, that, that I'm on? So, you know, you can't say, hey, I want to go to, you know, Flanders Smith and check them out. And then, you know, I maybe want to go to Prairie View because then you're going to bounce around. You're not going to establish community. Credits you, don't transfer. You, your credits don't transfer. Then all of a sudden, you end up, you know, end up being in college a lot long, potentially depending upon how your money set up. You may, you know, potentially incur more debt. So you, you want to have a plan, but that's why as you're going through this process, you go visit Philander. You say, you know what, you know, Little Rock's a nice place. You know, I, I, I like this. You know what, Prairie View. You know what, this is a light, nice place. I like, I like the community. You know what, Paul Quinn. I, I like it. It's close to home. I can see my mom. I can see my dad. I can see my. I can be close to my parents, but I feel like I'm away. Like you can do all these opportunities. The UT system has schools all across the country. If you want to stay relatively close, but it's important to you know do your research and think about what are your needs and what's going to fulfill you. We talked about costs, location, academic, career, and major. But then there are X factors. You know, there, there are things that like, you know, how, you know, what is the environment I'm in? What support systems do they have? Do they have the divine nine? Do I want to go to big D1 school that has sports? Do I want to go to school that, you know, is smaller, that, you know, every class is going to be 20 people where I can get some individual attention? These are the things that you want to kind of research ahead of time. So when it comes time to make that decision about where you're going to go to college, if in fact that's what you want to do, you say this school has everything that I want. We appreciate all of your questions. These are good questions. We appreciate people, you know, like who chimed in accordingly. Our goal is always just to have the conversation and to, you know, keep the information flowing. So thank you for having us, and um, and we're appreciative for all the coordination. And uh, you know, hopefully, we'll, we'll our, our books will fly off the shelves from here, and then you then we'll have to re-up and we'll have to give you some more. Wonderful.